Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Hermione Gifford. Uh, Dr. Gifford is a researcher at the Department of History at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And she is the author of a prize-winning study, The Making of Jet Engines in World War II, Britain, Germany, and the United States. And she'll be speaking to us this morning on how views of the potential post-war market for jet engines affected British jet engine development during World War II. Okay. Hello, I'm Hermione Gifford, and this is my paper, Designing for the War or After It, the case of the jet engine. Now, this conference, uh, we know, is about the RAF uh, from 1945 on. So what am I doing here discussing something that happened during the Second World War? Well, the first jet engines were certainly built during the war, but as I want to argue today, uh, this formed part of the Royal Air Force's plans for the post-war world. And indeed, by taking this perspective, um, we can make more understandable many aspects of the wartime jet engine programs. Roughly speaking, uh, we can understand the American, German, and British programs as having different aims. The American program aims at the post-war period, the German program is building weapons to use during the war, uh, and the British are kind of doing both. Um, but the weapons for the war clearly uh, have a post-war purpose. So let me explain uh, closer now uh, what I mean. Um, the Americans, uh, again, are pretty clearly building for after the war. They refuse to let existing piston engine companies build jet engines during the war for fear that this would take away from producing piston engines, which they needed to fight the war. Uh, it's pretty clear the first jet engines wouldn't have the kind of range um, that the Americans need for the kind of air warfare that they're waging. Uh, so what seems to be odd choices, General uh, Electric and Alice Chalmers, who developed the first jet engines in the United States, um, uh, in fact, are quite reasonable. So among com companies that are not producing aero engines, uh, because the war effort can't be threatened, these companies that are chosen have expertise in mechanics. But certainly, this isn't the highest level of commitment to the new technology uh, that you could have. Nazi Germany uh, is at the other extreme. So it's clearly building for the war. Um, they need aircraft to fight with, aircraft ideally that would give them qualitative superiority uh, over the enemy air forces they're engaged with at that uh, time. Uh, so this is a slide briefly showing the pros and cons. Um, the biggest advantage is, of course, high speeds. Um, the biggest disadvantage is that it's completely unknown um, and the engines are fairly costly to build. Um, the government, uh, we know, is willing to sacrifice pilot lives. Um, so they're willing to skate over the problem also of the lack of pilots, um, despite complaints from the Luftwaffe. So any possibility of it saving the Luftwaffe and Germany uh, through higher speeds um, is worth it. So what's the chief problem here they can do something about? Well, it's, uh, it's this last one, the cost of production. Costs in material, costs in time, and costs in labor. Um, it turns out uh, this affected their designs, that you could design jet engines to keep these costs minimal. So here's, uh, here's a slide briefly showing, uh, comparing uh, a piston engine, the Daimler Benz 603 and the U1004 jet engine uh, on uh, various uh, measurements. Uh, firstly, we see uh, it's much lighter. It uses less material than leading piston engines um, for, uh, for a similar output. Um, it's designed to run on inferior fuels, uh, less refined fuels, which is increasingly becoming a problem in Germany during the war. Um, and it's designed to be built uh, using less uh, man hours. So you can see the UMO at 700 man hours is really a fraction of the large piston engine, the Daimler Benz 603. Uh, the jet engines further are designed in modular sub-assemblies uh, to use the dispersed unskilled labor in Germany at that time. So we have the same question that confronted the leadership in the uh, United States. So which resources are going to be dedicated to the new development? And the answer in Germany uh, ends up being Germany's best aero engine firms. Uh, UMO, BMW, uh, and maybe Daimler Benz assisted of course, by Germany's research establishments, uh, slave labor, and uh, underground factories. Uh, and here's just a picture of uh, production of jet airframes uh, underground. Now, this explains a big part of uh, this graph, which shows the production of jet engines during the war. 
uh, we can see that uh, following this green line here, uh, production in Germany skyrockets during the war. Uh, the blue and red lines are production in Britain, uh, and they remain uh, low. So why did the British stay down there? Well, we look at the British program, uh, we see that it's kind of doing two things. So it's planning for both the poor, the war and the post-war period. So of course they wanted to show the Germans and importantly the British public uh, that Germany scientists are not ahead of Britain's. So they wanted desperately to fly a jet engine during the war. Um, and so when this happens, you see there's a great promotion of uh, uh, Britain as a jet engine and of Whittle as a British inventor. Uh, but this is also, of course, good post-war publicity because they've shown how innovative um, their firms are. So there are two aims, again, to help win the war, but not in the same way as Germany's deploying jets. So uh, jet uh, fighters in, in the United Kingdom are deployed not directly for fighting. Uh, and second, to help sell British aero engines after the war. So a focus on the post-war, when the British aero engine industry is among those looked to, to, or would be among those looked to, to uphold the name of British manufacturing around the world, uh, and perhaps <laughs> the solvency of the exchequer, uh, means that the Royal Air Force, uh, and more importantly, its leadership, is preparing for post-war competition, uh, which would be waged in both civil and military markets. So after the war, unlike the war, um, which is primarily military, uh, you have to cater also for civil needs. So these two aims um, then deeply shape the British program. It shapes what they fly during the war and what they produce after it. So it's not surprising that Nazi Germany, which is building for the war, of course, produces the best performing jet fighters during the war. Um, and this is frequently the question that asked, that is asked. Um, but as we can see, it's already biased because it values the priorities um, that you had in the German program, but not um, in other programs. So uh, let's step back for a minute. Um, can we consider the jet really a World War II invention? Well, uh, certainly the first uh, jet fighters are deployed and developed uh, during the war. Uh, they enter combat in 1944. Uh, this is a slide showing the ME-262 uh, on the left. Uh, this is Germany's first jet and the, the Gloucester, oops, the Gloucester Meteor. Um, Britain's first jet. Um, the ME-262 is meant to be used in the war, is used in the war, and is known for its dogfighting. The Gloucester Meteor um, didn't engage in uh, dogfighting, but instead brought down uh, flying bombs over uh, England, um, and it was never used over enemy territory. So the British, we know, did fly a jet during the war, and we can see in the initial promotion of Whittle um, and in the propaganda that accompanied it, uh, which is, uh, this is uh, a cartoon that appeared uh, in the Empire News, interestingly, uh, but it very nicely juxtaposes, of course, uh, Germany's scientists with the RAF here. Um, <clears throat> so this kind of, this kind of uh, propaganda demonstrates the Germans are not ahead with the technology and there's no similar uh, program for many reasons in Nazi Germany. So the unveiling of the Gloucester Meteor um, is part of waging the war, certainly, uh, but the use of aircraft, as you can see, figures in a very different way than for the Luftwaffe. So the RAF really, to do this, only needed a very few jet fighters. They didn't need many squadrons worth of jet aircraft. Consider too, if you're displaying a technology, right, rather than using it, um, how this uh, changes uh, the requirements for the technology. Uh, Britain's aircraft, uh, first jet aircraft, didn't need to be cheap. They didn't need to be quick to produce, um, and they didn't need to be able to fly that far. Um, interestingly, uh, the jet engines that power the aircraft during, debuted during the war, so the UMO 004 and the Rolls-Royce Welland, uh, don't lead to post-war engine uh, in any country. And yes, the, the UMO 004 and BMW 003 are targets of Allied intelligence, and GE certainly learned from, but didn't reproduce Britain's designs. So what does this tell us? Um, that the values that we see um, that shape the wartime uh, appearance of this technology don't apply to the peacetime market. So consider 
uh, now. If your goal is to make a jet fighter as soon as you can, so which was the goal of the German programs and uh, perhaps of Frank Whittle's program also, um, but instead it's to make a jet fighter that you can sell after the war to both military and civil markets, then you get rather uh, different ideas. Um, and this is perhaps where Frank Whittle's goals, in fact, uh, diverged from those of the RAF, but, uh, but that's a different story. When we look at the jet engines designed by British aero engine firms during the war, and all of Britain's aero engine firms uh, designed one before VE Day, we see a range of designs um, which tend to privilege theory and flying long distances with heavy loads at low cost. Uh, neither of these points to short-term investments. These are parameters that describe uh, peacetime application, shipping, or maybe passenger flights. Um, so it's a post-war vision of a broader market that enables the RAF to embrace um, really a motley collection of designs, um, which otherwise appear strangely divorced from reality, precisely because they aren't fighters and they aren't sure short-term bets. Uh, so for example, Bristol which is a key British aero engine manufacturer. Uh, Bristol is familiar with the concept of a jet engine well before the war, but has dismissed the new engine uh, as much too inefficient. Uh, during the war, Bristol proposes an accelerator. So to combine a jet engine and a sleeve valve engine, the Centaurus, their highest performing sleeve uh, piston engine. Bristol's very approach to jet engines here is defined by its reference point, which is a transport aircraft uh, and big piston engines. Uh, Napier, similarly, uh, but a less successful British aero engine supplier, um, which is also forced into jet engine development by the government, uh, proposed in 1944 to combine the Sabre, uh, a powerful two-stroke piston engine, with an axial gas turbine, uh, both of which will drive a propeller. Now, seen uh, from today, of course, uh, these designs seem a bit far-fetched. The, uh, the RAF then underwrites a shift to jet engines uh, in the aero engine industry, but this is going to benefit both civil and military markets. So um, we know that all of the firms that made military aircraft for the RAF also sold to non-military markets before the war, uh, and they continue to do so afterwards. Um, Rolls-Royce, for example, recognized that its Merlin was a very good military engine, uh, but not a good civil one because it needed a lot of maintenance. So already before the war, the company embarks on itself uh, funded development of a jet engine, in fact, to replace the Merlin. And this effort, uh, which later feeds into the Avon, is a long-term development. And this is indeed how the company uh, saw it. So military and civil markets are fairly closely related, of course. Uh, the civil is crucial to maintaining the expertise, the capacity for military production uh, in the industry at the time when military contracts are harder to come by. So the crucial shift then, uh, is if we understand the British wartime effort as at least in part a post-war effort, then we're not surprised um, that it had different, perhaps nonsensical uh, during the war concerns. Um, so we already see that we have to abandon any notion that the jet engine was a crucial invention uh, that you needed to have as soon as you could uh, and consider instead that there are many different types of jet engines uh, and many different routes to a jet engine. Uh, so a post-war lens um, helps us make sense then of a few things. Firstly, the differences between the wartime programs in Britain and Germany. Uh, the Nazi effort, which again is aimed at the war, makes the, no uh, the nation um, embrace a very extreme risk with a new technology. Uh, many of the first ME262s in fact did crash uh, and many pilot lives were lost. Against the word of aviation experts, uh, the Germans developed these engines in a very rushed way. This is development driven by the demands of war leaders uh, rather than development driven by industry or experts. The British, in contrast, don't have to take the risks uh, to make the things fly as soon as they can, though certainly they do take advantage of it if it does, uh, and in the form that it does, which we see with the Meteor Welland uh, combination. The RAF asserts the value of pilot life in the new development and reliability, uh, and it's not overruled. Um, so, so Britain, in other words, is, is content, right, to stay at the bottom of this production uh, graph, uh, to make a good, if expensive, engines. Um, 
we know the Nazis made compromises on the jet engine that made sense in the German war economy at the time. So their engines were cheaper per pound thrust than piston engines, which, uh, which were primarily designed uh, first in civilian economies. What the military market lets the RAF do uh, is support civil firms uh, without um, objection. So the Rolls-Royce project that I mentioned for a jet engine quickly turns from a self-financed to a government financed one. And the RAF um, in this way supports the nation's aviation industry in order to support it after the war. Uh, and they're not innocent of what they're doing by any means. The British program goes on enlisting all of the major, major engine manufacturers even in 1944. So at a time when they couldn't possibly produce an engine for wartime use. Uh, and the government certainly doesn't stop investing in capacity. At this time, um, we see the creation of institutes meant explicitly uh, to give uh, Britain uh, a competitive advantage in the post-war period when the new technology uh, would become increasingly important. Um, so think here of the national gas turbine establishment shown on this slide. Um, Britain is consciously laying the foundations for science and technical prominence in the post-war order uh, in aviation. So now my conclusion. The history of the jet engine uh, is generally confused by two things. So first, the fact that the Germans are celebrated as winning the race, although they clearly didn't participate in the post-war economy. So we're looking at kind of a truncated uh, program. And secondly, uh, the requirements for civil and military aircraft uh, are rather different, um, but jet engines are seen as invented in the Second World War as a military technology, whether or not they contributed, in fact, to the Second World War. The big disconnect that a post-war perspective helps us understand is why the first and second generation of jets uh, and those later uh, are so different. They were not particularly related qua requirements, unlike other technical innovations. Uh, so here's, uh, uh, here's an example just showing you visually, okay, the first uh, engines in Britain um, were, were really qua architecture very different from later ones. So unlike other technical innovations, what we're seeing um, with the jet engine is success in a milieu that accepted its initial shortcomings because it offered other advantages, uh, many in fact non-material advantages. The later market, the post-war one, drives the development of the technical innovations that lead to later generations of engines and those that indeed that we're familiar with today. So in a sense, we're seeing a very typical story of innovation, but what's different is that the early successes of the technology, when it's unrecognizable uh, in its successors, aren't hidden, um, as in other cases, but instead are trumpeted loudly as successes. Uh, so the line from invention to use is uh, more disconnected than for other machines. And that's why um, I think it's a mistake to focus on uh, wartime and not see the jet engine as a very important uh, post-war investment. Thank you.